Hello, and welcome to our webinar, How Enterprise Augmented Reality Powers Frontline Productivity in the Next Normal. I'm Abby Lundberg. I'm a business technology researcher and writer and president of Lundberg Media, and I'll be moderating today's discussion. Augmented reality can help companies work faster, smarter, and better. During the pandemic, AR has proven its worth by enabling many companies to continue operating with limited human contact. But AR's value goes well beyond that situational expediency. In the post-pandemic next normal, it will play an increasingly prominent role in helping companies to achieve new competitive advantage. In today's webinar, we'll move beyond the why of AR to talk about how to move forward successfully. This includes finding the right partners, deploying end and -end enterprise software, addressing change management, and more. We have two terrific speakers to lead us through this. Michael Campbell is Executive Vice President and General, General Manager for Augmented Reality at PTC. He's responsible for driving the product and technology strategy for the development of augmented reality applications. Donald Brady is a principal with Deloitte's digital practice. His work focuses on delivering digital transformation strategies and execution to clients. He's a leader of Deloitte Studios and Deloitte's digital reality practice. In addition to sharing their own expertise and insights, Mike and Donald will offer real-world examples of successful AR deployments and will share a few highlights of some recent research they've done with IDC. By the end of the hour, you'll have a better understanding of how companies are using AR to deliver business value on a number of key fronts and how you can too. Welcome, Michael and Donald. Um, unfortunately, Michael is having some camera issues, so we won't get to see him, but fortunately, he's got a great radio voice. So, Thanks, so Abby. It's great to be here. <laughs> Thank you, Abby. To kick things off, um, what effect is the current state of the world having on digital transformation in general, but the enterprise use of augmented reality in particular? Mike, you want to start? Yeah, I'd be happy to. Thank you. Um, hello, everybody. You know, I'd, I'd say the, the current situation, uh, the, the pandemics and the lockdowns and control restrictions and so on, you know, it's unquestionably been a catalyst for digital transformation in role and traction for our uh, particularly industrial enterprises. Uh, now, many companies that have been on uh, this trip um, and they're seeing benefits like uh, high growth and productivity, profitability, increased customer satisfaction and so on. Um, but the COVID pandemic has only totally driven a a hunger need for resiliency and business continuity, you know, really at all levels of both corporate and uh, and workforce as it relates to agility. Um, and all of this is, a, of course, enabled by digital transformation and particularly technologies like uh, AR, which we'll discuss today. So from PTC's viewpoint, in, in the best cases, we're seeing companies accelerate these kinds of initiatives. Um, and in the worst cases, we're seeing them trying to get started. Uh, but the good news, I think, is that it's not too late. Um, but I would certainly say I haven't spoken with many companies in the past year that haven't been focused on shifting and adapting to this new way of doing business. Thanks, Mike. Uh, from our Deloitte perspective, there's no question that the pandemic has fundamentally changed the world. Uh, for many industries, it has been an accelerator of change. Uh, for example, uh, we've seen a decade's worth of growth uh, in e-commerce share in just the past year as people have socially distanced and stayed away from uh, retail and restaurants. Uh, for knowledge workers, uh, work from home and remote work have become accepted. Uh, executives haven't seen the drops in productivity that they feared from remote work, and the attraction of reduced costs will definitely carry forward into a post-pandemic business world. Uh, many employees will ultimately prefer it as well, at least once schools are returned to uh, normal operations. Those change behaviors are not likely to uh, reset. Uh, from a digital reality practice perspective, that's AR and VR from our side, uh, what our practice has seen has uh, been increasing adoption of VR and immersive learning and training, uh, the use of AR in manufacturing and service use cases. Remote expertise in particular has been the use case most addressed. Uh, it's typically the starter use case. Uh, AR can help in a broader range of use cases that makes the uh, execution of tasks and processes much more efficient and help to address the uh, industrial skills gap. Uh, Mike, uh, PTC has a long history in the industrial space, so how do you see it impacting that sector in particular compared to knowledge workers? 
Yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a great point. I mean, we all we all recognize that frontline workers don't have the flexibility to work from home and enjoy Zoom and, and WebEx meetings like uh, like knowledge workers do. So, you know, those industrial enterprises that PTC is uh, most familiar with, they have uh, service technicians that are maintaining critical equipment and manufacturing resources that are responsible for, in some cases, delivering life-saving medical devices. And, um, and they're feeling extra pressure to implement these kinds of tools that you know can foster continuity in the face of restrictions and and in the face of you know sort of an need for for safety for their employees and and maintaining some distancing. Uh, as I said, in some way, the pandemic just exacerbated an existing problem. These industrial companies employ about billion frontline workers, and even before the pandemic, they were struggling with gaps in domain knowledge. Uh, Due to aging workforce right here in North America, the baby boomers are all retiring. Um, and, and they're also facing a generally negative perception of industrial work by younger prospective employees. They, they, don't, they don't think they want to work in you know, greasy, dirty environments where, where, um, where manufacturing work might be done. Um, and this is a real problem. In fact, more than half of the members of the National Association of Manuf Manufacturers are concerned about attracting and retaining talent even after the pandemic has, has subsided. So, you know, with all of that in mind and in order to meet their customer expectations, it's essential that these organizations ensure that front workers maintain a robust skills and can easily transfer knowledge um, amongst among the workforce. Uh, and, and this, of course, gets even more challenging when you fill in ever increasingly complex product and increasingly complex processes, um, you know, really that the market is demanding. And, and I think that's why we're here talking about augmented reality today. I'm, I'm convinced it's an essential part of the solution to bridge these gaps uh, so that companies can, can maintain and, and even increase productivity in the face of disruption. So you've touched on this a little bit, but but it would be great if you could elaborate a little bit more, both of you, on why we seem to be at a turning point for AR right now. Well, I, I think that I think that we're at a stage where AR is no longer a, a novelty technology. We're we're beyond the excitement of technical wizardry, and we're 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 now to a point where um, our customers and other enterprises that have deployed AR are recognizing true business value. Um, AR now allows frontline workers to get critical knowledge and information and insights when and where they need it in the context of their working environment. And you know, unlike traditional paper-based instructions you see on the, on the chart here, uh, augmented digital instructions are, they're dynamic, they're easier for employees of all levels of expertise to follow and used to complete tasks more uh, efficiently and accurately. And you know, this information could be procedural guidance, it could help them assemble, uh, repair, inspect something that's in front of them, uh, as you hear, or it could be other forms of digital data um, from sensors or analytic AI that provide valuable insights uh, that can help make them more meaningful contributor uh, to, to their case and to the value chain. And I think the reason that's so important right now is because how the pandemic has, you know, forged a new norm for industrial enterprises. It's, it's organizations consider new ways of working. Um, and I think the good news is these new approaches will benefit them far into the future, long after the pandemic has subsided. Um, you know, maybe Donald, from uh, from a systems integrator perspective, you know, do you do you see customers being more open to adopting these new technologies now? Yes, I, I do, and I think there's a, a few key drivers. Uh, like you mentioned, Mike, uh, first is the technology of AR as a whole. Uh, you've got enough computing power in devices like just shown to enable very realistic uh, AR experiences uh, and natural human interfaces. Uh, machine intelligence enables these devices to fundamentally understand the world around us as humans do, recognizing spaces and objects, understanding human gestures and spoken commands. Uh, Moore's law is going to generally apply and everything is going to get smaller, faster, cheaper. Uh, both, ma mo both major mobile operating system providers, that's Apple and Google, are providing a level of capability out of the box, uh, now even adding sensors like LiDAR and putting them into the hands of consumers and workers. 
uh, the technologies reached a level of maturity suitable for the enterprise, and in many cases, mobile devices are already in the hands of first-line workers. Where hands-free is a requirement, there's also a range of head-mounted display options. I also think that part of this too, though, is just that digital disruption is generally better understood. Uh, there's a higher level of digital IQ amongst leaders and a recognition that they need to be using new technologies that can fundamentally impact their business models. If they're not, then their competitors will. Uh, for example, say with servitization, where you move from selling capital equipment as a transaction to selling machine uptime, keeping that equipment running is critical. Uh, the AR capabilities that you described, Mike, they deliver shorter fix times, uh, better first time fix rates, or can even empower the customer to actually self-diagnose and fix. That's great, thank you. Um, so I, I mentioned the IGC research at the beginning and all of you in the audience will be able to access that. We'll send you a link uh, after a few days after the event. Um, but I just wanted to cite a couple of things from it. So uh, one, of, one of the data points was 63% of respondents to this, it's IGC's commercial AR VR survey say that they're actively using AR within their enterprise to some extent. So now would be a great time to understand where you and the audience are in your journey. So uh, let's put up our first poll question. And the question is, where is your company in its AR journey right now? And the options are early stages of discussion, pilot phase, early deployment, deployed to several departments, and deploying across the entire company. So just take a minute and Answer that poll if you would. I think maybe as um, as people are uh, uh, popping in their answers, it's uh, it's interesting to note that the the number of sixty three percent that had uh, let's say you know were active on their journey uh, that number was even before the pandemic. Um, so it'll be interesting to see how that uh, contrasts with the data we collect here today. That's really interesting. And here we have the results. So Mike and Donald, how does this equate with what you're seeing? Uh, so from my perspective, Frank, it's a, it's a little bit uh, surprising. Um, I'm glad that you're here today. Uh, well, met those of you that early stages of discussion, hopefully what you'll uh, learn today will, uh, will, uh, will prompt you, uh, you know, to continue on. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm surprised, uh, totally, but I think that, um, I think what we're seeing, uh, maybe more holistically market would be skewed a little bit further on in the journey. What do you think, Donald? So I, I think this is really interesting data, uh, frankly, Mike, and maybe there's a little, uh, perception difference, um, with PTC being squarely targeted towards the industrial manufacturing sectors. Uh, those sectors have been more advanced in their adoption of AR compared to others. Uh, what we see is that uh, from our side, we have lots of clients across different sectors at various stages of the journey. So I do think that this is a little surprising, uh, quite frankly, but uh, if that data is accurate, then this is a great webinar for, for everybody to be attending today. Yeah, I agree. Great. Um... So, so let's so let's move on here. For, for enterprises that are considering NAR strategy, um, as many people seem to be really looking into it now, or if they need help implementing one, what what steps should they take to ensure success? This isn't prescriptive, uh, Abby, but for for some things that uh, I consider for clients, uh, first, make sure you're starting with the problem. Um, is it poor yields in the manufacturing process? Is it low first time fix rates? and secondary truck roles? Is it institutional knowledge retiring and leaving the organization or attracting the next generation of workers? Uh, AR can be applied everywhere, frankly. So prioritizing through a business case is an absolute requirement. Uh, making sure that there's an executive sponsor with influence is critical. Uh, AR is not that different uh, in that the reasons programs fail, frankly, is less about the technology and more about the people and the organization. So you need that sponsorship. 
uh, thinking end state and working backwards. Uh, yes, you're going to start with a POC and maybe one or two lines or a plant, uh, but if you're going to be successful, you want to deploy to all your plants. Uh, walking backwards helps plan what that will take. Uh, thinking of that scale also naturally brings in considerations of change management, which is critical for uh, a successful deployment. Uh, with a clear problem, a uh, business case, and a roadmap, you should also inventory uh, what your organization is doing today and think about the capabilities that will be needed to deliver on that roadmap. Uh, it's unlikely that you would have everything you need in-house. For example, uh, do you have 3D modeling capabilities uh, in-house? Um, Mike, as an AR software partner, uh, you know, what are some of the things you discuss with customers at the outset of your relationship? Yeah, I mean, um, you know, many of those same tenants you described, maybe maybe a few others would be that we also um, stress the importance of organizational buy-in um, in order to maximize the business impact of an AR strategy. We've learned that it's critical for the real stakeholders to be you know, fully invested and committed to both standing on and executing the uh, program. Um, as you mentioned, Donald, it has massive potential across different elements of the business. Um, but to unlock that potential, you need a, a clear strategy and, and, and you know, an understanding of the potential value at scale. Uh, but as well as at every stage along the way, um, you know, those are all those are all key, uh, key, uh, key um, elements to understand. Um, we also recommend that companies uh, start small with a meaningful use case that um, we've proven AR can improve and, and, and drive value through. Um, and then backs of that success onto the next opportunity to, to drive more value. And, you know, I think this is where a partnership, both an experienced software vendor and a systems integrator with domain and technical know-how can, uh, can come into play. And, you know, PGC and Deloitte are very well suited to help customers plan and implement and execute that full-scale AR strategy. Um, based on our expertise in the space, right? We know what works, we know what doesn't, we know what problems the technology can fully address and, and frankly, which ones it can't because it can address them all yet. Um, and we know how CUS can achieve the most value um, and success are. And this point around AR impacting uh, the, the entire, in this case, we're at an industrial uh, price value chain, but having broad impact. Um, you know, let's just talk uh, you know, for a minute about what impact it can have in each uh, department, um, you know, workforce modernization and, you know, leveraging the digital thread to drive better communication, collaboration, better products in the industrial space, for example. Um, so with manufacturing and the supply chain, uh, we see a lot of our customers leveraging AR uh, to empower workers with better intakes, uh, increasing their productivity, really the quality of work, and ensure it gets done safe uh, in a compliant way. Um, and of course, help minimize downtime well. AR has an impact in customer operations by improving the end customer's experience with self-service and training options. Um, you know, it can also provide OEMs, machine builders, an additional revenue stream uh, because they can provide AR-powered uh, premium product offerings is a, is a common use. Um, new revenue streams are also opened up in customer service too uh, by delivering premium AR-powered uh, service offerings. Um, companies can improve technician productivity and safety and you know, their overall effectivity. Um, and, 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 you know, that's important from the bottom line, but it's also important from a customer satisfaction standpoint, right? The end customer gets uh, better quality of service, gets increased uptime, uh, all of which, uh, all of which they like, of course. Um, AR even enables engineering teams to collaborate uh, using, using augmented, uh, augmented reality to visualize designs at scale relative to the physical world. Uh, you know, as new products are being designed, that can be very valuable sometimes. Um, and then finally, in sales and marketing, you know, we have many customers that are that are using AR uh, to build virtual product demonstrations uh, that they might bring to the customer site. They might just share with the customer. They might use at a trade show uh, when those happening. Um, they're also using AR to provide uh, differentiated product and brand experiences, building customer loyalty. So you know, there's a, a literally a ton of potential here. Um, and again, I think working with great partners like PGC and Deloitte is uh, is key 
to unleashing that potential effectively. So I'm I'm really struck by you know not just all the the amazing potential for using AR uh, across an organization which you know you don't really think about I haven't really thought about in the past but also you know as you engage all those different parts of the organization sort of the complexity of that so so I think now would be a good time to check in with the audience again to understand uh, wh what are you most wary of when you think about implementing an AR strategy? What, what part of moving forward keeps you up at night? So the options are identifying the problems we are solving, uh, defining the business case impact and KPIs, establishing buy-in as Mike talked about and alignment from stakeholders, or determining partners to work with or scaling the AR strategy. So just take a minute to answer those questions. So a pretty good mix across the board here. Um, you know, Mike and, and Donald again. What, it, what? How does this equate to what you're seeing, and what do you think of this? Donald, uh, what do you think? Um, let me go first on Mike. Yeah, I, I think this is not surprising. I think um, the cluster around the early stage of the roadmap. So identifying the problems that we're solving, and I think that's. Um, easily solved through workshopping. I think there's a plethora of opportunities for the application of AR as we just discussed. And then that really sort of comes down to defining the business case, sorting, prioritizing, and really identifying where you're gonna apply this technology first. And then the third bullet, the third 23% uh, uh, establishing buy-in category as well from stakeholders. That's really where the prioritization in the business case and establishing that clear roadmap I talked about earlier, working with executives to explain how this is going to solve a tangible problem and either impact top line revenue growth or uh, the bottom line through savings is really key. And I think also as part of that journey of executive stakeholder engagement, with AR and VR, what we really see is you have to you have to put them in, in these devices and make that experience come alive for them. Once they see that, once they experience it firsthand, that buy-in is, is very, very tangible. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I think it's interesting that the most prominent, um, you know, challenges here, um, the, the first three really built on one another. It's a lot easier to find a business case, you have a clear picture of the problem you're solving, and it's a lot easier to establish buy-in if you've got a compelling, you know, point of view on what impact will be. I think that it's, um, I think the good news uh, for the audience is that, um, you know, if, if we were having a discussion, maybe, uh, maybe uh, three or five to go. Um, it, it, there was a lot less information helping you through those initial stages. Um, I feel like, you know, many others have, uh, have sort of been down this path now. And collectively, I think certainly between PTC and Deloitte, we've got a shared point of view on, um, on, 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 on how to get to the answers to these types of, uh, types of questions. So that's, uh, that's maybe a little bit of the good news. Great. So, um, Given given some of the challenges of going forward, and you're thinking about adopting something that no, you know, some people have never really worked before, don't have a lot of insight into, what can organizations do to help ensure successful adoption and deployment as they're adopting these new technologies? Abby, in our experiences, there's really sort of two equally important change management tracks, if you will. Uh, you have one from the top of the organization, which needs to address the, the program funding, governance, communications, uh, and other program aspects to ensure that the stakeholders are, are fully aware and providing the level of needed support to make that program successful. Yeah, I I, um, I agree with that first one. I, I think that it's um you know it's an essential it, it's essential to have an overall digital transformation strategy and buy-in from the top. So much of what we're talking about um, again builds on the back of other initiatives. 
um, you know, in terms of digitized content and, you know, all of those kinds of things that you want to, that you want to drive through this technology. And certainly most successful customers have uh, executive level internal champions that are, you know, really accountable for the benefits that AR can deliver um, and are committed to the success of the program to achieve those gains. Yeah. And, and the second track, which is just as important or maybe even more important, is change management targeted at the employees in the field. Uh, Gemba is the, the Japanese word common in, in lean manufacturing. Going to that place of work and making sure that you understand what the processes entail, uh, asking questions, respecting and learning from those that do the work. Uh, this is an inherently a human-centered design process and it generates outputs that will make the end solution valuable and much more likely to be adopted. Uh, considerations of the operating environment and safety are, are often critical elements to understand as well. And, and since you're fundamentally changing the way people work, that, that change is often better communicated by those doing the work. Uh, we like to identify champions who are respected and bought in as the messenger of change. Uh, simple is also often better. Uh, we've done things like deploying AR devices with uh, AR games on them so that employees can get familiar with operating the device and using gestures. Things like laminating cards in uh, tough or dirty environments for quick uh, reference materials, uh, making sure that positive experiences and stories are uh, recorded and told uh, both at the task and field level and at the overall program and executive level to further build up that excitement and buy in our, our tactics that uh, that we've used. Yeah, well that, at PTC, we have another perspective. I mean, AR, by its very nature, is an deeply, deeply personal experience. Uh, not only are we trying to positively impact the way frontline employees, for example, do jobs and interact with their work environment, we are literally changing the way they see the world. I mean, that's what's saying here. Um, so, you know, while we am a, a modern user centric design approach and, you know, we're make this experience as delightful as possible for the, for the answers, uh, certainly, you know, preparation for the kinds of changes is, uh, is, has been found to be key. Um, you, you can see this play out in the case study that's featured in the IDC white paper that we'll share, uh, that case study highlights, uh, PTC Euphoria customer that's had a lot of success with AR. And part of that success is due to the fact that they made sure to establish the buy-in across the company before implementing the strategy. So the upper level management, the line of business owners, IT uh, that we talked about initially, but also our own end customers who were the ultimate answers. Um, you know, they did a lot of uh, a lot of building and familiarizing and you know managing that change and because we had a, a a strong strategy on change management because all the staples understood their role the value they get from the program uh, they've been able to scale uh, their AR strategy quite effectively. Yeah, and uh, you know this is something a lot of organizations are going through um, in general right now. That is sort of a cultural aspect of engaging employees in in how you roll things out and, and what works and what doesn't work and uh, you know i think that's that's a piece of it too um so so you've talked about the partner relationship and and certainly with something like this it's so new that's a, it's an important piece of the puzzle so what can partners do to help an organization implement its ar strategy thanks abby i i think you know, putting myself in the audience's shoes, the, the starting point is one of organizational self-awareness. Uh, is my organization self-sufficient? Does it have a track record of successful programs delivered internally? If, if that's the case, you, you may only need partners to fill in specific capability gaps. Uh, for example, if you don't have that 3D modeling capability that I talked about earlier, the AR ecosystem is diverse and there are many good niche agencies and solutions out there uh, on the other end of the spectrum are organizations that they know they don't have the capabilities to deliver on a program of this nature and need help with articulating the vision, uh, understanding the use cases, prioritizing, defining the program and how it might be deployed across the organization. That, that's really where companies like Deloitte and PTC come in. Uh, we might be the single hand to shake to help with the entire program or a large part of the whole I think we're, we are that single hand. Regardless, we often work with ecosystem partners like PTC who have deep experience in areas like manufacturing and engineering. 
Uh, in PTC's case in particular, there's a suite of complementary solutions that let you go from a CAD system to a hologram on an employee's device overlaid with contextually relevant uh, IoT information. Uh, if I were to evaluate global systems integrators like my own company, Deloitte, I look for relevant industry expertise together with a, a history of investing and developing uh, an AR focused group or practice and more broadly uh, in general industry 4.0 focused practices with good case studies and, and quals. Um, Mike, can you talk to uh, how PTC partners with its customers in conjunction with uh, systems integrators? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks. Um, and as you, as you mentioned, I mean, we had literally decades of experience uh, with helping companies leverage, uh, you know, our technology to improve engineering, manufacturing, service. Um, and, you know, we understand the problems these customers face. And we built our company basically by helping them address them. Um, and when it comes to AR, we do the same thing, right? The, the, the strategy is to work with our customers and help identify where AR can make a meaningful impact. Uh, as we've talked about by identifying the uses that are most appropriate for AR um, and where we can drive the outcomes. And that exercise leads you a shared view on value. Um, and then work together uh, to apply the technology, realize the promise of that value. And, you know, I think that for the audience, by working hand in hand with an SI, as well as a software partner, uh, you can benefit from, you know, the unique expertise that each of us brings to the table and, you know, really get an advantage, a leg up deploying an AR strategy um, from start to successful completion. As, as folks in the audience start, sort of look forward to that journey, uh, once, a, once a company has selected the partners they want to work with, what are some of the considerations for deploying an end-to-end -end solution? So I think separating strategy from implementation and deployment, there are some logical next steps, Abby. We, we often do hardware and software evaluation, both to identify the right device or devices, as well as the right solutions from a software perspective. That doesn't need to be a long drawn out phase. Uh, it frankly be accomplished in a couple of sprints. Um, you need to view the initiative as a product as well, not a project. Uh, you need to be prepared for constant iteration in, in maybe the, the fastest moving technology ecosystem that there is. Separating those hardware and software considerations and relying on platforms such as those provided by PTC abstract you from the hardware considerations. And it's definitely a, a best practice. Uh, you need to be executing on the defined roadmap uh, that adds additional capabilities. Uh, one critical observation is that where head-mounted displays are being deployed is supporting use cases that encourage daily and frequent usage. Without that frequent usage, there's a tendency to just fall back to remote expert as needed. Uh, once deployed, making use of the data that's coming out of the solution to feed back into the product itself is critical. There is so much great data available by using AR in the field. Uh, where you need more custom capabilities, where the, the rubber hits the road from a talent perspective. Uh, this is where many organizations may not have the needed talent in specialized areas. Uh, XR engineers are absolutely the hottest skill set from an engineering perspective right now. Uh, many of the big tech disruptors like Google, Apple, Facebook, Amazon, and others are investing heavily in XR, and it does present uh, a real skills barrier to other organizations. We sort of touched on change management already, but it's never too early to plan and execute on the needed organizational changes and begin communicating and working with the field in advance to make that deployment as successful as possible. Yeah, those are those are uh, those are great. Um, you know, I, I would I would reiterate the suggestion to separate uh, decisions about software from the hardware, uh, really because by doing so, you have the option, uh, or or you actually are future proofing your investments for a longer term. Um, and this is in special. This is especially important considering uh, you know the early stage, the nascency of the head-mounted display or digital eyewear market uh, today. Um, another another you know question uh, to be asked is whether you need an out of the box solution that is really targeted, or uh, you need flexibility and a more platform centric solution uh, that can be can be custom tailored to your needs. 
Um, Donald, you touched on, you know, evaluating whether your company has the capabilities to implement an AR program on its own or would need outside help. Um, I think the good news is that you can implement an AR strategy either way. Um, and your choice really depends on uh, the use cases that can drive the most value for your, for your company. Um, and, you know, re really, we, we've embraced this reality at PGC. We offer an array of solutions across the AR portfolio. Um, that have built to meet the distinct needs that our customers have and to make it easy to deploy a complete solution use case. Um, our solution trick uh, out of the box offers that, you know, are really targeted, they're guardrailed, I like to say, they provide fast time to value. Um, and, the, you know, we also provide platform centric offerings. Uh, these are more flexible um, and really can be used with um, tailoring and some invent to address virtually use case that you might um, find value in. Uh, there are, you know, across this portfolio, market leading capabilities for creating AR content to address really key use cases like augmented work instructions, virtual product demonstration, training, and uh, remote expert assistance. Um, and then it's also worth pointing out that AR solutions are available across a wide, broad spectrum of hardware types. Um, and it's important to think about your use case and whether you'd like to take advantage of the devices that your employees likely already have in their pockets, right? Phones or, or tablets, um, or if a hands-free approach makes sense uh, for your working environment. Um, and, and as Donald said, the frequency of uh, frequency of use for that particular use case. So I think finding a software provider that supports uh, various types of hardware is a key consideration for selecting the one that's right for your business. Great. Well, um, thank, thank you for that great overview. And, and also thank you for the imagery, because I think that it really helps to sort of bring home what we're talking about. Um, we have some really great questions coming in from the audience. And we will continue to take your questions for the remainder of the hour. And you can submit these in the GoToWebinar questions module. Um, so I think I, we'll start with this one because it sort of is a, is a fundamental question, uh, level setting kind of thing. Can you explain the difference between AR, MR, and extended reality and sort of the whole family of AR, VR? I'm happy to, I'm happy to share my perspective. I mean, I think that this is a, um, th there's, there's, there's lots of debate about this and um, you know lots of there are lots of points of views as companies try to uh, differentiate um, you know their particular offering in the market um, most of what we've been talking about here today uh, it, it all falls under the category of augmented reality and augmented reality is simply overlaying digital content on your view of the real world now what is that content um, is that 2D content that is floating in sort of a floating billboard or a, or a panel? Um, is that 3D content that appears to be mixed with real world? Appears to sit on a table. Uh, maybe it moves uh, with uh, with the help of a six engine. It appears, you know, maybe to fall off the table. Um, that's generally what um, what people would refer to as um, mixed reality. You also heard Don use the term XR, which is, um, from my perspective, a superset, which would include both augmented. Uh, virtual reality, which is different than what we've been talking about, it virtual reality, and you transcend time and space, distance and scale. You know, you're in a completely different, entire virtualized world, as opposed to slamenting the, the physical world that we're living. Um, so those are thoughts from my perspective. Don, how do you how do you break down? Yeah, we we have a spectrum that that we define. I think that the question's insightful and, and maybe speaks to the first audience poll around where people are in their journey right now. Actually, you can see behind me a range of devices that that I keep uh, on my on my desk behind me that cover uh, both uh, VR. I'm trying to match my hand to the direction here. VR assisted reality and mixed reality as well. Uh, my recommendation is not to get too hung up on the definitions, but again, think about the problem and what's needed to help the worker solve that problem. Uh, that's when you can sort of distill down to, hey, do I need an assisted reality device like the one in the middle there, which has a hard hat on it, and maybe is suitable for a rugged environment? 
or am I a knowledge worker uh, design collaborating and maybe a mixed reality solution is, is the right approach. So that separation of problem from technology is, is something I definitely encourage. Mike, um, given where the audience members are in their journeys, where do you see the most drive to adopt an AR strategy within an organization? Where, where might they look to, to see that popping up? Who, and who are the biggest champions for AR typically? Yeah, I think um, I think that this is a great, a great question, and I would say at a high level there are two categories of uh, people that we age with. Um, the first category are um, are the innovators. Uh, you know, they work for a chief digital transformation officer, a chief innovation officer. Um, you know, they are tasked with understanding um, the state of technology. What's the latest, greatest? Uh, and generally, our conversations with them are about the art of the possible. What 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 I do? Um, their motion is generally um, one that is just to me. Let me go play, right? And and that's fine. That's an important that's an important category, and, and that's an important audience. Um, but if you've listened closely, you've heard both Don and I talk about um, the importance of identifying a use case, driving business view, and you know, as, as uh, considering the companies that, that that we represent, uh, that that's that's why we exist, right? That's what we're trying to do. So there's this other other um, category of engagements that we have. Um, that that then these folks come from many different organizations. I would say at PTC we see a lot of them um, representing manufacturing, representing service, representing sales and marketing, and and these are places where the digital and the physical world colliding can unlock a tremendous amount of value in some of the use cases we've talked about, whether it's virtual product demonstrations or um, augmented work instructions or remote assistance. Um, and generally the, the the types of representatives that show up there would be folks that are um, you know, responsible for uh, you know, improving the efficiency of those organizations. Great, um, we've got a couple of questions around um, a topic I'm really interested in. Could you talk a little bit more about how AR adoption can help companies be more innovative? Um, I think I think a couple of more than a few people in the audience have are interested in that in that track. Yeah, let me jump in there, Abby. Sure. I, I I think that part of this is something I mentioned earlier, which is considering other technologies as well. I think putting executives and people in your company into AR and VR is a critical part of this. Um, many executives might be uh, older and they might not have familiarity with the technology, but I, I guarantee you that their, their younger children uh, are using AR probably on a daily, if not multi uh, times a day basis through common platforms like uh, TikTok, Snapchat, Instagram, et cetera. So really putting people into it, letting them experience it, letting them have that wow factor really open up really opens up their their eyes and then i think if you can tie in other capabilities that uh, that uh, might be relevant to solving that challenge whether it's uh, 5g edge computing iot whatever it, whatever it is just getting that into the hands of executives to experience firsthand can't be underestimated maybe i would also just add abby i mean i think when, when i think about um the 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 potential of AR with really an eye toward our customers' innovation. Um, some of the things that strike me is um, customers that are using AR to uh, supplement their end consumer's product experience. So typically, you know, if you make a if you make a widget, you design the widget, it's great. You send it, the customer uses it. Um, that whole experience can change pretty dramatically when you add a digital element in the form of augmented reality. Um, Lego is a is a is a great example of that, right? If anybody in the audience has children that play with Legos, um, more and more they are embracing the the digital aspect and and frankly using using augmented reality in many ways to do that. Um, you know, to sort of embrace the 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 the, the younger generation's desire for digital experiences. Um, but you know, really fundamentally change the play experience. One other example is when you're using augmented reality, and, and Donald hit on this earlier at the top. 
talk. Um, it's easy to think about using AR to convey information to someone. Um, but once we've, once we've got devices in people's hands, once we've got did eyewear on people's head, we are actually all in a sense, instrumenting the workers. So we can gain greater insights into the work they do, how they do that work, where there are issues with the instructions that we're providing, where there are inefficiencies um, in the way that they do that work. Um, you know, once we begin aggregating that data and um, and 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 analyzing it and, and gaining insights from it, um, so that is a that is another angle of innovation I think that is closely tied to what we've been talking about. And maybe we didn't go into um, you know as deep in the time we. No, that's great. Um, and of course, you know, when when whenever we're talking about transformation or doing changing how the company does things, there's always, of course, the the question of ROI and and value, business value. So so this question is, um, what is the best ROI case for using AR, and is it product design? And I'm I'm, I'm sure that that that's company dependent, but if you could talk that through that a little bit and give us a couple of examples of, of where where highest ROI is coming from based on particular use cases. Mike, would you like to take first stops? Yeah, I'm happy, <laughs> okay. to. happy to. Either way, you, you yep, go first, um, I'll jump in. <laughs> okay, great. So um, again, re remember that, um, that, that my domain of expertise is the industrial enterprise. So I think a lot about the value chain. I think a lot about process and product um, uh, discrete and, uh, and, and, and um, process manufacturing. Um, but what I can tell you is that we are seeing um, the most um, success, the most adoption, the most value uh, generated in two use cases in particular. Um, one of those is in manufacturing. And um, the, the second is service, I'll talk about each. I think it's those two categories because um, that is where, um, again, the physical and digital worlds collide. A manufacturing engineer is faced with a variety of tasks. They could be um, assembly, they could be inspection, but they are working with the physical world, which is key for augmented reality, and they benefit from um, from digital content um, being presented again just in time. You know, really at the point of need when and where they need it. Um, and the same is true, frankly, in in service. Right? I am a service technician. I've got to support maybe a portfolio of uh, tens of thousands of products. It's impossible for me to know everything that needs to be done on all of them. So having this superpower of augmented reality that can give me information like what are the diagnostics, what uh, what are the uh, disassembly instructions, what are the gotchas, what are the things that I should be aware of, what is the domain knowledge that uh, other service technicians have garnered over the years and have made available to me, all of that can be presented in, in, in augmented reality. So from my perspective, those are two incredibly high value use cases. It doesn't mean, I, I, gave, you a, I gave you a long list earlier. It doesn't mean that there's no value anywhere else, but um, that's where we see the greatest traction and the greatest ROIs. And those ROIs are sometimes quite meaningful. It's hard to say, you know, the ROI of AR is 50% savings because it really does depend on the use case, on the current state, um, and on a variety of, uh, of constraints or affordances that your company may have. Uh, you know, one, one great example is, do you have access to 3D CAD data? Um, you know, one approach for presenting work instructions is to present it in 3D. Well, if you don't have that, okay, that's not going to work. Then are there other approaches around, again, capturing tacit domain knowledge from experienced workers that can be applied there? And when you do that, what kind of uh, savings um, you know, might you see? And it could be savings, it could be productivity. I mean, there are a variety of different ways to measure it. Um, so those are a few thoughts from my perspective. Donald, what do you think? Yeah, I think learning and development is one of the key areas, uh, Mike, where we see a lot of activity and it's sector independent. Uh, so sort of what we call is, what we, 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 what we term learning in the flow of work is, is a critical one, uh, both learning before the job and then on the job through AR work instructions. And that's very sector independent in my mind. Yes, it's, it's really obvious in a, in a manufacturing environment that it's highly valuable. But in retail, for example, I'm just going to swerve into a different sector uh, for the benefit of the audience. You, you have many organizations that actually have an excess of 100% employee turnover a year. And there's data that shows that XR-based training is highly effective 
and actually even influences employee retention as well as their performance on the job. So there's a great ROI case in uh, the retail sector. Uh, you can then go into retail more broadly from a consumer perspective where virtual try-on is actually the killer use case. The ability to see a product uh, either on your face if it's a pair of glasses or makeup, uh, shoes or clothing or even furniture in a room. Uh, I recently used it myself to, to buy a Peloton uh, size, the area in the bedroom where I was going to put it and have the confidence that that product would actually fit in that space. The benefit for the retailer there really is less about um, a higher uh, purchase uh, lift, but more around confidence in the purchase and reduction in returns. So the, the applicability is super broad. And it gets back to that prioritization case uh, we argued earlier. And in terms of what gets in the way of implementing AR, are there particular things that are stopping people from moving forward? Is it is it you know only the lack of vision about what's possible, or what what really gets in the way? You want to start, Donald? Sure. I think from my perspective, what what gets in the way is just you know that. Identifying the where to start, frankly, is the one that gets in the way because when you take a look at the key use cases that, that AR can provide and apply it across your organization, there's just a, there's a, there really is a plethora of areas where it's applicable. And then how do you identify the one that makes sense and how do you congeal the organization around that particular one is really, I think, the, the 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 blocker for many people starting. Once they start, they can end up, and I know Mike's going to riff on this too, it, what, what's called pilot purgatory. They can't quite get out of the pilot mode into the scale mode. And I'm going to lob that one over to you, Mike, because I think pilot purgatory yeah. is something that you see as well. Yeah, it's 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 a great one. As I, as I said earlier, you know, the... the um, situations where we began our journey with uh, with a uh, company and um the starting posture is we'll just give it to us and we'll go go figure it out right it's obvious it applies everywhere you just give it to us and we'll go and we'll go figure it out um you know that that's exactly the trap that you're talking about here um and that's why i think uh there's so much such a better approach is to identify a high value use case and go off and get a win learn the lessons learn what device works learn um how 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 effective was your change management process and then go on build and build on top of it so it, it's it's a little bit the the curse of ar is how um how broadly applicable it is in some ways uh the fact that i can do so many things with it means that i actually might not do anything with it <laughs> so um so that be that's what we spend a lot of time trying to help our our customers through um, that, that's, that's probably the, the best answer as it relates to blockers. Um, there are other points of friction along the way. Um, you know, digital eyewear is a, is a good one. Um, is, are, is digital eyewear, you know, the optimal experience we all want it to be? Well, no, right. They don't, it doesn't feel like a pair of Ray-Ban, uh, quite yet. Now everybody is working toward that and I'm confident that we will get there. And there's tremendous value to be realized along the way. Um, but is a HoloLens something you want to wear for, you know, an eight-hour shift? Probably not. It's uncomfortable, it's hot, and the battery will die. Um, so, you know, there are other points of friction along the way. But I think in terms of blocker, um, you know, figuring out where to start is the key. Great. Um, as we're heading into our last few minutes for the webinar, do do you both have any final recommendations or words of encouragement for our attendees as they embark on their own AR journeys? Donald, you want I to start? Think, yeah, I can start, Abby. I think uh, I, I mentioned it briefly, but considering uh, AR or XR as part of a whole, um, you have other technologies in the industry 4.0 bucket that are transformative. And many of our more advanced clients are now weaving in 5G and edge compute together with augmented reality and IoT. Uh, so considering that whole, I think is very important. Uh, over investing in the, the planning and getting internal alignment, uh, over investing in working with the field, if it's an industrial manufacturing or service use case, uh, the, the, the GEMBA, and then I think also that sort of think back, think big rather, 
and working backwards, starting small and, and iterating and putting that success on the board, as Mike mentioned, are sort of the, the key recommendations I would have. Yeah, I would I would add uh, maybe uh, maybe just three other points. I you know I that uh, the first would be AO. Um, AR is real. It's here. Um, there's a good chance that it's already making an impact on your competitors' business right now. Um, and as I said uh, to start the discussion, we're seeing customers who have weathered the pandemic far better than some of their competitors uh, because they've already implemented AR. So uh, act now. Don't left, don't be left behind. Um, the second is um, really developing a plan, right? We've talked a lot about that, but uh, but deploying an AR strategy is is all about getting getting those wins, realizing value, and then scaling from there. And um, you know, I think that a uh, that a plan uh, where you dig and then you know figure out where to begin is the is the right approach. And then the last one is uh, just get aligned, right? Um, planning, uh, you know, combined with a strong partnership with companies like PTC and Deloitte. Um, are, are key to the success of a program and, um, you know, get that internal buy-in from, from all of the stakeholders. Uh, I just want to sort of loop back on, we have a couple more minutes. I, I want to loop back on one thing that, that you did touch on, and that is, um, you know, given, given that a lot of the people in the audience are, are early in their journeys, um, if they're not the person who uh, has the ability to drive it, but they see the value. Do you have a suggestion for how they, you know, who who do they go to? Who do, where do they start to sort of apply their own influence and leverage to help their organization move forward? That's a, a broad question, Abby. I can take a first stab. Uh, you know, I, I think in understanding if your organization does have an innovation function, if they do have an innovation function, I'll be kind of surprised if they're not already looking at augmented reality. So if you're not in that function, reaching out to them, understanding where they are with their um, early POCs or experimentation would be sort of one key way. And then I think, you know, nothing will resonate with folks uh, above your reporting chain than, than actually focusing on that business case on the returns and speaking that language as opposed to uh, AR as a specific solution. AR will, will, will drag along with that conversation. That would be the advice that I have. Thank you. Mike? I, I I agree. I think Donald answered that uh, perfectly. Nothing uh, nothing more to add. Great, and and we are just about out of time. So I I want to thank you both, Michael and Donald. Um, this was really interesting. Um, I learned a lot, and I I know the audience did too. And and thanks to all of you in the audience for your attention and your great questions. A final thank you to our sponsor, PTC. We we appreciate your support for this topic. Have a great day, everybody.